Welcome back to Indie Cult Horror. Uh, I hope you enjoyed episode one with H.G. Lewis and just in time for the 50th anniversary of the groundbreaking Night of the Living Dead. I have a special treat for episode two. We're going to see my interview from 2003 with John Russo. If you're not familiar with who John Russo is, uh, he is the co-writer along with George Romero of the original Night of the Living Dead. Um, he had a couple other roles in that film as well, on screen and off, like most of the people involved did. Uh, he, with R Russ Streiner, also of Night of the Living Dead, would go on to write what became Return of the Living Dead. Uh, Russo went on to make many movies in Pittsburgh, stayed independent, uh, worked with, mostly within the genre. Um, he has written books about filmmaking, he taught courses about filmmaking, he, he's another person who really exemplifies this indie filmmaking that I love from the grassroots horror scene. This interview is also from the 2003 Fangoria Weekends of Horror, it's actually the next day after the interview you saw with H.G. Lewis. Uh, Russo was kind enough to let, uh, let us do the interview uh, right before the show started, so uh, I do apologize, you're going to hear some background noise. Um, it's, the show actually started while we were doing the interview, so it went from being kind of quiet on the floor to there's some bursts of music and talking. Uh, unfortunately, that's how convention rooms are. Um, also, minor technical issue I had on this one, for some reason the time code is permanently displayed. I uh, wish I could undo that, but oh well. Uh, it's, like I said, that was my first week of being a documentarian, so not much I can do about it now. Um, so I hope you enjoy this interview I did with John Russo. Uh, hi, John Russo. I've been uh, writing books and making movies for a long time, starting with the original Night of the Living Dead. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, making the Night of the Living Dead, uh, the experience on your first film? Well, we always wanted to make feature movies. When I say we, I mean George Romero, Russ Steiner, myself, and the other group of people we were associated with in those days. And, uh, we started making commercials and industrial films as a way of trying to buy some equipment and get some studio space and eventually work toward that goal of making a feature. And we thought we would make a... Eventually we had all our own lighting, editing, and camera equipment, except for a 35mm camera. And then we bought a 35mm camera, an old one, with an 80-pound blimp. Uh, they made movies with in the 30s and 40s. And that very week, we started talking about, let's make a, let's make a film, let's get out of this stupid grind and make commercials. And we thought we'd make a, a horror film, we could do a better job than what Hollywood was doing at that time. Because Hollywood was cranking out movies that were formulaic and dull. And he always went, you know, the giant grasshopper, and the giant caterpillar, and the this and that and that. And you always went to these movies expecting or hoping to see something good, but it would always be the same plot that the creature, nobody believes there's a creature, but the audience eventually it kills the town drunk. And then the scientists get involved and they find out how to defeat it. And then the National Guard comes in at the end with flamethrowers does it way with you know, the same thing over and over and over again. So we wanted to make a, a movie that would, our expression at the time was, let's make a movie that really pays off the people who want to see a good horror film. They walk out of the theater saying, the last good movie. So that was our goal. I can go on and on about that. <laughs> oh, why did you choose horror for your first uh, film? Well, like I said, we thought, we could do a better job at making a horror film than what Hollywood was doing at the time. Now, I had seen two movies that really impressed me that, uh, and showed me that something good could be done in the genre. And those two movies were the original Invasion of Body Snatchers, which I didn't know what I was going to see. I was home from college on a break, walked into the theater, and the people coming out of the 8 o'clock show had these stunned looks on their faces. And I thought, oh man, they look like they've been to a funeral. You know? What the hell is going on? And I saw that picture and it just blew me away. It was, I think it's a great movie. And the other one is not strictly horror. It was uh, Mysterious Planet. But it had monsters from the id, which was 
this came from the mind of the people on this planet. And the, and those, that was a pretty powerful movie and it was scary as hell. And, and it had, you know, science fiction but horror aspects to it. And I said, oh, okay. If we can make a movie that has that same power, then we'll succeed. I want people to come out with those same stunned looks on their faces. So that's why we didn't. In fact, we killed off Ben at the end. You know, and I said in one of our script meetings that, um, you know, you can't have, Pennsylvania is a big deer hunting state. And every year, all these hunters and inexperienced people go out with guns. And they, seven or eight of them get accidentally shot every year. So if you have these posse members going out and vigilantes basically gunning down zombies, and zombies look more like a person than a deer does, somebody gets killed by accident, and wouldn't it be ironic if it were our own, own hero, Ben? So everybody said, yeah, let's do it. So that's the ending I wrote. However, the first ending, you might be interested to know, the girl didn't die, Margaret didn't die. The sheriff came in with the same guy that shot Ben. They're working their way down to the basement. Barbara's down there, and they have their guns ready. And they turn the corner, and they're all ready to drill her until one of them spots a tear rolling, rolls down her cheek. Corny, you know. That's how I wrote it. And then somebody said, "Well, I don't. I forget whose idea it was that, that her brother who never dealt with." her brother, and would he really be dead or would he have turned into one? So we said, well, he got his head smashed on the tombstone. It could be that since his brains penetrated, he wouldn't come back, but then again we thought, well, maybe he would come back. We're inventing these flesh-eating zombies as we go along, too. Nobody had done that before. As we said, yeah, let's let Russ come back and he helps drag her out. And that's, that's that. So. Uh, how about, uh, I read that there was a, a thought of having a, a last shot of, uh, of Kira Shan's character. That uh, was Carl and Marilyn's idea. And we probably didn't do it only because we had to shoot in bursts. The cemetery was actually filmed in October. Part of it was filmed, part of the cemetery was filmed in June. We had 19 days shooting, then we went back for some more shooting, then we went back to the farmhouse in the fall, and it was, we didn't know if it was going to rain or what, but the leaves were off the trees, it was lucky we had pine trees in the cemetery, but lucky we were shooting black and white because some of the leaves had turned color. And, um, and just because of that situation, we wanted to finish the film, and we said, let's do fail-safe kind of ending. Fail-safe ended with a nuclear bomb was going to drop, and then they freeze-framed, and then you saw all these looks on the people. You knew they were doomed, and they used, they went to a grainy look. So we said, let's let's go up to the point where they shoot Ben, and then let's take do it all with stills, the closing of the movie. Stills music, a grainy look like that, and, uh, and then the bonfire gets lit. So that's all that came about, and we, and we then didn't do the thing with catching a glimpse of Kyra because we went to stills instead of live action. I guess we could have shot us. You know, she was nine years old at the time. She might not even have been there. The uh, ending you're just describing with the um, like the nuclear kind of explosion, kind of that's that's with the stills of the people's expressions. That sounds how the, the way that Return of the Living Dead ended up ending. You know, I don't remember. I guess so, and that, that's now that sort of maybe Dan knew that we got the idea from Failsafe because there you have two films ending with a nuclear explosion, right. so the ideas kind of married together. Yeah. What was the difference with your story, Return of the Living Dead, and the movie that got made? Well, our version was straight horror. It still should be made. It's very stark, and it's much more faithful to the original style of the movie. It's different. It's not, you know, it takes concept forward. Like I said, you know, if this really happened, religious cults would spring up around it. Yeah, for sure they would. You know, dead, not dying, and all that. So we start with a religious cult, and a dead child and the preacher says a prayer against the father, a mallet, and a spike. He has to put the spike in the girl's head. They believe the dead have to be spiked. 
They're pretty and green candles, and I garnish them. And, yeah, and they're treated like knots and authorities are, you know, trying to persecute them. Not persecute them, but actually maybe deserve it. Then there's, there's a big accident, and, you know, people do start coming back. So, and it, and it, it's very We actually had, like, a raiding party of you know, people that were gunning down zombies and stealing stuff in the chaos. It was going to deal with the human condition caused by this phenomenon. You know, like, people, society disintegrating, vigilantes being on the loose, thieves, robbers, killers, loose in the countryside at the same time as zombies are. And I think George picked up on that idea because he turned it into a SWAT team and they were gunning down, you know, doing the same stuff because he read our script and I read his. Anyway, that's, that's how that came about. But then when it, when it finally got sold, it was one of those periods where it happens in the movie business where everybody says, oh, horror's dead, don't make another horror film, blah, 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 blah. And Ryan, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it as a horror comedy. So I got down to, down to Bannon to rewrite it as a, as a horror comedy. And then I novelized his version, which is this. This is this is actually our version. So now there are two Return of the Living Dead novels. Um, um, this one sold out. This one we still have some. Uh, one thing I, I, I also see, I mean, you have your scare tactic books, you have the, the great uh, film book that you did about making Night of the Living Dead. Um, you have your the videotapes, your, your school that you're starting. Uh, why such an interest in helping other people learn how to make movies? Well, I started out as a teacher. I taught, I taught English for two years, and that's in my blood. And it was, George and I did a movie in, about a broadcast school in the 1970s. We did commercials and documentary films. And right down, I said, we, there should be a film school. And, but, but then you had to shoot on film, and you had to have that synchronizers and movie movieolas, and the problem of how to get a large class through all that. You know, the ideas stay in our minds, but we, we couldn't think how to implement it until I finally came up with, well, now we have the digital thing and the video and that whole revolution. Now you can make a movie cheaply and the equipment isn't cumbersome and isn't expensive. And besides, so many people know how to use these cameras that, and they don't need to learn that. What they need to learn is how do you direct for film and how do you light professionally and how do you, what's the difference between uh, and what makes something sell and what makes it smooth and professional and, 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 and the stuff that's done by people who don't know that yet. So that's that's what I teach and that's what this book's all about. And the first one, Making Movies, gets into the nuts and bolts pretty much because the publisher wanted that and then this takes it forward with the more creative end of it. So. Now the uh, the kind of I guess you could say your own film scene that came in Pittsburgh because of you and Romero and all the people who were working together there. Uh, how was that different than working like how is working in Pittsburgh outside of the Hollywood system or even the New York independent scene? How is that different, and why do you stay with that? <laughs> uh, from grade school on, I always did things my way. Teacher would give an assignment to write this or that or that, and she'd say to do it this way, and I'd have what I thought was a better idea, or she'd work this way, and I'd figure, I'm going to do it my way. If it's good, I might get an A. If it's not good, you know. And I usually I'd get the A. And so that's the way I am. I do things my way. And I don't want to wait for the bureaucracy. To, you know, I always end up making a film for a low budget if I can't get the big money because I'm not going to sit on my hands. You know, I'm going to do something. And a lot of times, you know, I mean, obviously you can make a better movie a lot of times if you have a little more money. Things, But I've learned, I've gotten very good at making low budget stuff look like bigger budget stuff, sort of pulling it up on its bootstraps, which is again what I teach in the books and, you know, the workshops, seminars. Now the, uh, That's the same thing. We didn't want to go out and start in a mail room and work our way up with with the major student. We just wanted to do it on our own and be in control. Now your your all your films and your novels are all horror. Are you are you like the novels a, are? You, uh, I've done some films that aren't. The new film. Uh, 
this is being marketed worldwide right now. It's like a, it's like a, the nearest thing to it might be a Sopranos with with, with good music and and a sense of humor. And uh, we have Chuck Cordy who's around here somewhere. But he's a he has a world class soul singer and uh, he's did a hell of a job with the acting. But you see, we have Debbie Rashad in it. She gets her throat slit. There's, there are seven people that get murdered. There's a lot of action. Things blown up because it's about a mob boss who who's victimizing this band that's been struggling to succeed. And they, they get a chance to turn the tables on it. And things really go crazy. Well, would you describe yourself as a fan of horror and science fiction? Uh, well, yeah, when I was a kid, I mean, all through my... I saw all the films that came into town, and I saw all the horror films. And, I, you know, like I say, I kept hoping to see something good when I did, and I liked it. Well, I went to see all of them, and I kept thinking. And I read the, you know, Tales from the Crypt. That was stuff I liked. When George made Creep Show, I knew exactly what he was doing. A lot of people missed the point of that movie, and it wasn't as successful commercially as it should have been. And I saw it recently at the New York Horror Film Festival. They screened it, and they gave George a Lifetime Achievement Award. And I got a big kick out of it again. I haven't seen it since it was first made. It's just a really well made film. And if you know what those comics were into, it's just like, you know, that's what it's like. You get a lot of chuckles on it. How do you feel about fans of your films and your work and going to these things like conventions? Well, that's what, make, that's what makes it all work. You know, if people didn't like the stuff, we wouldn't be in business and we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And one thing that does annoy me when you come to conventions like this and you have some people, you know, here comes a fan that bought your DVD and paid thirty dollars for it. Now you're going to charge them twenty dollars for it to autograph it? Get the hell out of here! You know, <laughs> that person already bought your stuff, and if he didn't, if, you know, hundreds or thousands of people like them didn't buy them, you you wouldn't have a career. So where do you get off charging them to sign something they already paid for? That's my opinion. <laughs> and I like meeting the people. You know, it keeps you fired up, and you say, well. There are people that, are that like what you do, and, and you know, um, so, I mean, when we were doing 12 or 16 of them a year, and it gets a little, uh, we have to go ahead and do, Sorry? sometimes you get tired, oh, but still, oh. <laughs> I mean, it's part of the business. There's Chuck there. Chuck never has been to one of these, and he is amazed, but he always are when you see the first one. Uh, last question I had for you, um, for show is... Yeah, I better start paying some more. Yeah. Um, the, uh, if if uh, Universal Pictures or one of the major companies were to come to you tomorrow and tell you you could have carte blanche however much you want and complete control, or you had a project lined up that you'd rather be doing on your own, which would you do? Would you, would you rather stick to what you were doing on your own? My temperament is to do smaller movies about people rather than the stuff, $100 million pictures with all these special effects and the, you know, the, all that stuff. It doesn't interest me so much. I can be entertained by it. Like, you know, I really wanted to see um, Saving Private Ryan because, I mean, that's great. They recreated what that landing was in that on the same token. I wanted to see uh, Gladiator because I, I wanted to experience what those days in Rome were like because I'm into that. And, but I... Look, if they let me do something that I wanted to do, I mean, which, you know, you always have to sell them on something. Um, um, that would be one thing. I kind of lost track of the question. Uh, would you prefer to stay independent and work on your own, or would you do a project well, studio? Well, it's sort you can have both uh -oh. if they give you enough creative control. You know, just let me do it. Give me creative control. I've had that happen. And I've had them say, you make the movie. I'd also have them say, you have creative control like on Children of the Living Dead, and then I didn't. It was a nightmare, you know? It's like welshing on the deal, and then you're stuck. Uh, so, everybody has these, they're horror stories, business horror stories. Every single person that's been around for a while has these stories, like Toby Hooper tell me, he said he made invaders from Mars. They bought the property, H.G. Wells, I think, 
now they want to make invaders from Mars. And all he starts making invaders from Mars and shooting it. And they said, you know, we don't really like the fact that they come from Mars. Couldn't you rewrite it and have them come from somewhere else? And Tony said, well, you, bought, you got invaders from Mars. Where do you want them to be from? <laughs> you know, I mean, just Nazi stuff that happens. I don't even mean, a lot of it. I'll tell you what, I've been in with I've been in with productions full of cokeheads, every kind of crook, every kind of backstabber. I mean, you know, that happens. So, turn some cokeheads loose on anything and you will get a mess. Uh, any last words? Anything else you'd like to say? It's not bad. Turn some cokeheads loose on anything and you will get a mess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let me say. Enjoy the convention and uh, nice talk. Well, thanks again for tuning in for Indie Cult Horror. I hope you enjoyed this month's episode. Uh, John Russo uh, it was a, a fun interview. I've met him many, many times. Uh, he's an interesting guy. And we'll see you next month. Thanks. <laughs>